The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our program this afternoon, which is um, geared towards our 2019 Kuhawai Conference and Expo presenters. So if you're joining us this afternoon, you're probably um, have a program that was accepted at the conference and you've joined us to kind of learn, um, as we promised, some um, some tips to help you um, do your best in Toronto. I think we're going to be um, presenting, um, you know, some, some of you who have been on this webinar, who have been presenters and been on this webinar before, um, have probably heard some of this, but I think we'll be presenting some new information today. So I'm excited about that. Um, and before I talk too much more, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lori Sabata. I am um, the professional staff leader for the, um, uh, the um, Conference and Expo Program Committee. Um, well, I have two other presenters, colleagues that are online with me today, and I will um, introduce um, both of them in a minute. But before I do that, I wanted to just kind of get through some um, housekeeping items. So the first thing I want to do before I get too much farther is do a quick tech check because I want to make sure that I'm actually broadcasting and that, um, you know, the slides are, are visible and that you're able to hear my voice also. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm talking uh, to someone and not to, uh, not to an empty room. So what I'm going to do is ask you to um, just look at your control panel and there should be a little like a cartoon hand there. So if you would mind just clicking that. Um, that tells me that you can hear me okay and um, things are well on your end. Great, I'm seeing hands raised, so thank you so much um, for doing that. I really appreciate that. Um, just a quick word on recording. Um, I know there's a lot of um, presenters who were not able to join us today, so we will be recording this webinar and we'll be providing a link to that on YouTube. And so we'll be sending that out and we'll be making that available on the Presenter Service Center and other places um, so that folks will be able to go in and, and view the webinar and certainly be able to pass it along. You know, if you're a presenter and maybe you're attending and you have three other presenters and you want to send them the link, you'll be able to to do that. I wanted to talk a little bit about the flow of the presentation. So we're going to have um, obviously some presentation time with myself and my other colleagues that are online with me. And then we're going to take some time at the end for questions and answers. And the way we're going to do that is we, we have the audience on a listen only mode. So basically you're on mute. So um, we have quite a few people in attendance. So um, I'm gonna direct your attention again, if you're not familiar with GoToMeeting, you should find a panel or a, a box on your control panel that says it should say either chat or questions. If you have a questions at any time, just go ahead and type those right in. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to ask those. Um, just go ahead and ask them and um, we will make sure we take time at the end too. Um, address any of those questions. So I am going to go ahead and get things started. So I mentioned that um, I had some colleagues with me. So Christine Winget, University of Florida. Christine is our program committee chair um, this year. And we also have Erica Barton with us from University of Washington Seattle campus. Erica was kind enough to join us today and offer some expertise on universal design. So we'll be hearing from Erica um, in a few minutes. So I wanted to first start off about talking, talking about something that's really important, technology, because um, we have to find a way to present our content. Uh, this is actually a picture from one of the Ed Session rooms in the Metro Toronto Convention Center. And as you can see, Christine was nice enough to take this photo and share it with us. Um, so I want to mention that each room has a, a standard equipment setup. So it's going, you walk in the room, you're going to see a projector there with the screen. Um, there will be audio in the room, but you must bring your own laptop. So, and along with that, you want to make sure that you bring any of the accessories that go with that, including the power cord, any adapters that you need, the rooms are usually, you know, to connect the laptop with the um, projector, they usually come with a standard HDMI cable. Um, so you might want to take a look at your laptop ahead of time if you haven't already and see what kind of connector you use. Um, you may need an adapter, so that would be a good time to visit your IT department and say, hey, you know, I'm going to this conference. Um, they've got HDMI. I don't have that. I, what kind of equipment can you give me to help me out? 
Um, so and if you get into a bind, you know, we usually do have um, some, um, our, our AV, wonderful AV company that helps us um, usually does have a few lying around. So we're usually able to help out with that too. I know that a lot of times uh, Mac computers can be a little bit tricky. And then obviously we don't all use laptops either. Lots of times we have tablets or other devices that we use to project. So again, I think just the important um, part there is that you check it out ahead of time, make sure we, you bring what you need. Um, I wanted to mention too, it's important, we do have round table rooms that are set up specifically for round tables. Round tables are meant to be discussions, they're not meant to be really a presentation, so there is no technology in those rooms. So I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit about PowerPoint. So uh, we did provide, do provide a, an Akuhawai, an official, you know, uh, Akuhawai branded template which is available on the Presenter Service Center. And hopefully you've had a chance, well, most of you have had a chance to log into that Presenter Service Center and accept your program. Um, and if you haven't already, um, you can log in and you can find that template there. Um, we have a few just sort of guidelines um, for that PowerPoint. So the very first line that I'm gonna read here says accessible and easy to read. And you know, I think for a couple of years we've had this line up here on this slide that says accessible, but we don't really talk about what that means. Um, so in a few minutes, um, Erica is going to join us and she's going to talk about what that means. And again, may, many of you are already familiar with universal design already way past me and are already there and then some. Um, for some of this, this may be somewhat new and for some of us, you may be somewhere in the middle of that. But we're gonna talk more about what that word means in a couple of minutes. Um, and along with that, it's always best to uh, avoid anything that's too flashy. Um, definitely test video and sound before you begin presenting. Sometimes it's tricky to embed um, YouTube videos um, and you definitely wanna test the sound in the room to make sure that it's projecting through the speakers and the audio systems that are in the room and leave yourself enough time to get assistance um, from your AVSC tech to make sure that that's working. Um, and we do encourage the use of the, the PowerPoint template when you're able to. We do understand that there are instances where the template may not fit exactly what you're doing, and so that's okay too. I am going to turn it over to um, Erica. Thank you, Erica. Great, thanks, Lori. All right, so thinking about making your presentation accessible, the first thing you want to do is make a very clear assumption uh, that there are going to be people in your audience that may have disabilities. Even if that's not visibly apparent to you, make that assumption and be thoughtful about how you are bringing them into your presentation content. Um, that will certainly aid you in being uh, accessible and using universal design if you start with that uh, assumption. When preparing your session, really consider the accessibility in terms of your content, how you're delivering the information, your uh, prepared materials, if you're offering any handouts, anything of that nature, uh, and any interactive components. So you wanna be thinking about the whole of your presentation as you think about accessibility and really bringing everyone in to your presentation, not just the majority. So in PowerPoint, uh, if you're not already famil familiar with the accessibility tools, uh, that is, can be a helpful way to spot some easy fixes for accessibility. Uh, and you can, in PowerPoint, just uh, do a quick search in the tell me what you're trying to do for accessibility checker uh, and that will give you some tips for making your presentation more accessible. Uh, and then a quick uh, resource, a simple Google search of universal design and ACPA will provide you with a couple of great resources around universal design. I came across this resource uh, at the beginning of the year in actually putting together a presentation on universal design, and it's a fantastic uh, resource. So again, a quick Google search of universal design and ACPA, and the guidelines provided are uh, really helpful. We can go ahead and click to next slide. All right, 
So some real simple do's and don'ts I'm going to go through to be thinking about universal design and making your presentation really accessible. So the first, uh, one is, the first thing I want to offer is use the microphone. I am certainly guilty of thinking, eh, my voice, it's loud enough, I can project to the back of the room. Here's the thing. The microphone is not about you, it's about your audience. So use the microphone even if uh, you think you have a voice that projects to the back. Um, you want to verbalize all visual content on your slides. So it's very common to make references like, as you can see here, and right over here, this, this picture here. So making references and then perhaps pointing to items on a slide, but not actually talking about them or verbalizing them. Uh, and that is a surefire way to um, actively exclude people with uh, visual disabilities from your content. So really want to verbalize all visual content. Provide a few copies of full page slides for your audience. So if you're using PowerPoint, you I would recommend starting your presentation and have just a, a few copies printed of full page slides, not the little uh, handout sheets, but full page slides. And just make an announcement at the start that you're passing them around uh, if anybody uh, needs them to be able to follow along. You don't have to have them for everyone, but making sure that you have uh, a handful. So if you're sharing handouts with um, the audience, make sure that you have a couple versions of your handout in a, a large print font. I would avoid um, printing on really large paper, however. Try and figure out how to get large print font on a regular size, eight and a half by 11, if that's what um, the rest of your handouts are on. Uh, choose fonts that are really simple and not overly decorative. I would highly recommend avoiding italics, cursive, anything that's uh, really decorative. You want to um, make sure that the font is really clean and clear. <coughs> Excuse me. You want to use high contrast colors, black print on white, as you can see, uh, or as I have used on these slides um, right now, or bla a black background with um, a really strong white contrast of letters. But you want to avoid um, colors that uh, are overly complicated and uh, it impacts that contrast. You want to avoid graphic, overly complicated graphics or charts. If you feel like you need to use a graphic or chart, really uh, be thoughtful about providing a, ver a um, written explanation of the chart or the graphics so folks can um, more easily engage with the content. All right. Fantastic. Okay, so maintain a body posture when you're presenting. Maintain a body posture that's making sure that your um, lips are um, visible to the audience. So um, be sure that you are keeping your body posture pointed towards the audience and not like positioning yourself so you're looking at the, the screen that the audience may also be looking at. People may be reading your lips to enhance um, their auditory experience. When responding to audience comments or questions, it's really helpful to repeat the question or uh, comment every single time. Even if you heard it clearly, the way sound travels, it may have come easily, the message may have come easily to you, but might not have been as easily heard by everybody else. So making sure that you are repeating questions or comments um, will really be helpful. 
And then if engaging with an audience member who's using a sign language interpreter, it's important to remember to engage with the audience member uh, as opposed to sort of directing your attention to the interpreter. Ensure that aisles are wide and provide choice for anyone using a wheelchair. So it's really ideal if somebody could can come in and choose multiple options as opposed to just a single option at the very back of the room. And then finally, for those roundtable discussions, really be thoughtful when you're looking at the room to make sure that it's providing enough room for people to um, adequately move around. So thanks, Lori. Um, there's a slide up here. Uh, this is actually a screenshot from the Presenter Service Center, so it should look somewhat um, familiar. Uh, this is um, where you will go and find that um, Akuhawai PowerPoint template that we just talked about. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the template itself um, has some issues that aren't in compliance with universal design, and we are aware of that. Um, so I think we can just um, do the best that we can with that and just know that this is a first step in the process. And we're going to hear, be hearing more, a lot more about universal design. Um, but that is where you will find it. It's also where you're going to upload your presentation. The due date on that is June 7th. Um, so um, now would be a great time to, if you haven't already, to start working on that. Uh, we really like to have those presentations uploaded because they are placed in the mobile app. A lot of people look at those ahead of time. They use them to make notes and do other things. And then they're stored in the Akuhawai library so that they can be cataloged and used for resources later. I wanted to point out, though, that if you are a primary presenter, you are the only person that can do the uploading of the presentation. And that's basically because it prevents too many multiple copies um, of, of a presentation and so that it's a little bit easier for one person to sort of gatekeep what the final presentation is. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Christine to talk about um, some demographical information um, from last year. Thank you, Lori. Uh, so again, I'm Christine Winget. I'm the program chair um, for this upcoming conference. I'm really excited uh, that you all will be joining us as presenters. Um, the committee enjoyed reading through presentation proposals and we had a lot to do. Um, and we are happy that you all rose to the top to be able to present at this upcoming conference. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Denver delegates. One of the things that we really wanna point out is that um, this year's conference could look a lot different in terms of attendees because of the location. Um, and so you'll see some numbers that maybe will look a little bit different. But over the past few years, we've really been trying to better understand the attendance at our events. Um, and that goes for actually all the events beyond just the annual conference. Um, but obviously, kind of who's in the room of each presentation really influences our choices on how we're figuring out what presentation should be accepted and which one shouldn't. Um, also for marketing purposes for the conference and other things like that. Um, sponsorships, what that looks like and who is there based on who is attending the event. Um, and then what the perception of the event is. So do most people perceive it to be only for entry level professionals? Is it only for a, a a certain group of professionals or is it for everyone? Um, so this again is a profile of last year's conference in Denver. Um, and so we'll go through and just so that you know that inf this information will be collected again from registration data um, of this conference and will be shared after the conference next year. So you can actually see this, any um, Akuho I member can see this information after, the, after each conference. So I encourage you to kind of take a look. As Lori said, these slides aren't perfect, um, and so um, there are a few things that we could do better in the future on these. Um, but I'll start off with gender. So you can, um, in this graph, it shows that 52% of um, the folks who attended are female, or identify as female, 47% identify as male, and 1% identifies as other. Again, this is self-reported data. Um, Sexuality, 81% identify as straight and 19% identified as LGBTQ. Um, for race, 71% identified as white um, and 29% identified as a person of color. Um, for location, this is probably the one that we'll see hopefully a little bit of a rise on. Um, US based was 92% in Denver and 8% non US. Um, for education, so this is education level of the person who is attending, 
Um, less than a four-year degree is 3%. Um, a four-year degree, so a, a bachelor's would be 14%. Master's degree is 70%, and then post-master's is 13%. So you can kind of see the differences there, too. It's kind of interesting to look at, um, at least I think it is. Uh, and finally, age. Um, and so this, again, represents all of the attendees that came to the conference last year. Less than 1% were under the age of 25. 30% um, were 25 to 34. 34% uh, were 35 to 44, 20% um, were 45 to 54, 14% were 55 to 64, and 1% 1 was 65 plus. So um, again, just some interesting data as you are kind of thinking about putting together um, the final touches on your presentation, which is I'm sure where you all are at this point, um, so that you can kind of keep that in mind. This I find extremely helpful. Um, and this shows the primary functional area of the folks who are attending. So again, many of us may have multiple roles at our institutions and so may identify in more than one um, functional area. However, this is primary. So primarily um, at the conference, residence life um, primarily in that function area is 59%. So something to think about as you're doing presentations, especially if they're outside of the residence life realm, how to relate it back to those residence life professionals. Um, and more than one area is 24%. So people had the, had the ability to do that. Business operations was 11% and facilities was 6%. So again, I, I encourage you as you're putting together your presentation to really think about that um, so that you can better connect with the people who are sitting in the audience in your presentation. Um, and then also with position level in organization, 1% um, was paraprofessional, so this would include RAs. It would also include our graduate students who may be attending as long as they don't identify as a coordinator or RHD which is 17%. Assistant director is actually our largest, um, until we get, well, second largest, I guess, um, in attendance, 23%. Associate director is 13%. Director level, 11%. And then senior housing officer is actually 26%, which was a lot higher than I would have imagined, but it kind of makes sense um, based on the um, what the conference covers and things like that. Um, those who are in the AVP, VP, CEO, senior executive, president position, whatever it might be, 7%, and then 4% identified as other. So a wide array there. Um, keep in mind, you had to choose an audience um, that you wanted to present to at this conference and base your presentation on that. So I would encourage you to go back to that and make sure you remember um, what audience you looked at because I, uh, participants often choose where to go and what presentations to go based on that. Um, and so some of the feedback that we sometimes get through the evaluation process is that it didn't match kind of the description in that way. And so just think about that as you are putting things together. All right, and the next slide, this, the first time I saw this a few years ago, I was shocked, I'm not going to lie. Um, but this shows the delegates by institution. So how many delegates kind of attend from in, each institution. And you can see here that 51% of the folks who attend are the only delegate from their institution attending the conference. Um, so again, something interesting, I think it's really fascinating to be honest, um, because I'm at an institution where we have a lot more attending. Um, so it's interesting to keep that in mind as you're talking with folks from other institutions as you're presenting and you know asking them to connect with colleagues maybe it's they're connecting with colleagues back on their own campuses and so being able to have those discussions um, two delegates uh, is about 22 percent um, three to five delegates from an institution is at 19 percent six to ten delegates is at seven percent and 11 delegates or more is one percent so I sometimes think people think there's a lot of people that all get to go from the same institution. And actually our numbers show that that's not as true as we may think. Um, and over half, uh, there's only one person from that institution. So I found this pretty fascinating um, myself. And now we are going to move on to some things to keep in mind as you're building your presentation. The first thing is practice. Um, so it's important to know what your content is. Um, you know, obviously folks know when you're talking about and they know when you don't know what you're talking about. Um, as Erica said, being able to 
project and be able to look at the audience as you're speaking is much more helpful for everyone in our audience than those who are looking down and not being not being able to take your eyes from the page that you are looking at. So make sure that you are rehearsing your content. Don't rely heavily on those written notes. They're great to have, and I would definitely encourage you to do that. I know a lot of times for presentations that I do, I'll have an outline um, that's there if I kind of get lost, right? So if somebody asks a question that was a little bit off topic and I need to jump back and go through that. Avoid the ums and the likes uh, and the so and the, all those things in between. It's really easy to fill up space and you don't need to fill up space. Uh, and the really something I would really encourage you to do is to rehearse with fellow staff and to get feedback. You still have time to do that. Um, we have over a month and a half um, to kind of pull in a few colleagues and say, hey, I'm giving this presentation at the upcoming conference and I would love your feedback. That can really, really make a difference for you feeling more confident with the material as well as the presentation, but also when the audience members are there, they are going to get more out of it because you are more prepared for what you have ahead. So um, those, the practice is important. Um, outline your content. So having a opening slide with the presenters, the program title, the program number, they're going to, everyone will be doing um, paper evaluations as we have done in the past. And so they need to indicate this information on the top. It's nice if you can get that out of the way at the beginning. And if you have it on that first slide, they don't even need to ask at the end. Um, providing learning outcomes. So what do you want those participants to learn? Realize that you actually already have done that. You put that in your program proposal. Some of them may have changed a little bit. So make sure to update those if you want to update those, but otherwise just share them. Um, explain why the content is important, but also why it's unique. Why did you feel it was important to share this information with fellow colleagues? Um, and then also share with them when you will take questions. Um, one of the things that we know about our delegates is that they want to be engaged and they want to have the opportunity to ask questions and be engaged throughout the presentation. So if you would rather have them answer, ask questions at the end, just say that at the very beginning, and that is completely fine. Um, just so that members know, because different presenters have different ways of doing it, and if you can be upfront at the beginning, that's really helpful. The next part is interactivity. So really, this is where it's at. Um, for those who have given presentations before, you know that if the, if the presentation is interactive and then folks are more engaged and they are going to walk out of the room knowing more. Um, so if you can, if it works in your own presentation style, stop for questions. Um, it is easier for a participant to ask a question when you're on that topic than to remember it to ask it at the end. Um, now, one hesitancy I would share with you here is that you don't want to get bombarded with questions. Um, so kind of keep that in mind um, because you want to be able to cover all of the material that you have prepared. Plan activities. If you can um, plan some sort of activity, even where they're talking with the person next to them, um, whatever it might be, keep in mind the room setup. So you saw the picture that Lori shared at the beginning. That will be similar to the room setup. Um, most of them will be theater style um, with classroom style in the front. So classroom style means that there's a table um, and then theater style in the back. The chairs are close, they're connected, um, so it makes it hard for people to move around. And also, as we're, as we're trying to make sure that our presentations are as accessible as possible, making sure that folks have enough space to be able to move around. So keep in mind as you're planning activities that those kind of restrictions or um, difficulties, I guess. Um, make sure that you're moving around the room as you're talking. You don't need to stay in one spot. Again, make sure that the audience can see you and that you are um, they're able, if they are relying on reading your lips or at least as a secondary option relying on that, um, make sure that they can see you. And then have that participant interaction. So whether it's questions, answers, smiles, um, whatever it might be to be able to really interact with the participant. Finally, um, you want to apply knowledge. So demonstrate what you are saying works through example and experience. It isn't just you're saying this information. It's bringing the real theory to practice. This is what we learned in graduate school, right? And it's just continuing that. It's making sure that we, that a, a, an audience member, a participant can see, oh, that's how I can do it on my campus, or that's how it really works. Use stories to reinforce your points. 
Um, and I think that a lot of people, as they're doing presentations, like to build in a few stories. Don't be hesitant to do that. Um, obviously, you want to protect the folks that you are speaking about, um, so make sure that you are careful in that. But any stories that you can use kind of to go back to your point are going to, are going to help the participants understand better how they can implement that on their campus. And let's be honest, that's what it's about, right? It's about our, our participants being able to sit in a presentation and realize, oh, I can do something about this. And Lori's going to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Thanks, Christine. I remembered to unmute my phone this time, too, so um, that's a good thing. And yes, that was actually a really good segue into, um, I just wanted to mention this concept of critical thinking. I know this is by all means not a new concept. Um, there may be some in the listening audience who are um, experts in, at, on this topic. Um, it's certainly not new, but I wanted to mention it because this is something that is going to be um, you're going to be hearing more about that's going to be coming up more and more often as it pertains to how we present our content to our learners at the conference. Um, so, so basically, as Christine was mentioning, talking about, you know, sharing your, your experiences and your examples and your stories um, is one way of sharing your knowledge. And I know that typically, um, Mostly in the past, we, you know, our presentation style consists a lot of more of a lecture type style and, and that's always good too. And there's an, a time and a place for that. So we're not saying that we don't want to do that anymore. And again, this is something we're just kind of starting to explore. So we don't really know what this looks like yet in terms of how we want to incorporate this into our presentation style and design. But one thing that we've been talking a lot about lately is this concept of, you know, individuals come to the conference for many, many reasons. Um, and when they're attending an ed session, many times they're attending that ed session because they have a problem that they want to solve. And so how do we help our participants um, that are sitting there with their problem? How do we help them take all of the knowledge and experience and stories and information handouts that we give them, process that and turn that into a solution? So by using the information that you give them, the inf their own experiences and knowledge, um, and turn that into a solution is kind of like the basis of critical thinking. So I wanted to bring it up. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. And again, um, you know, applying it exactly is not something we know exactly what that's going to look like yet, but it is something I want you to think about as you're building your um, presentation, think about this little process and think about how we can um, help our um, help our uh, participants become critical thinkers. Um, so I'm going to move to the next slide after that. So we're going to go through a few more tips. Um, so um, we did, uh, I think Christine kind of already talked about this, about um, sort of reflecting and, and using examples and um, talk about lesson learns and maybe things that you would do differently in the future. So it doesn't necessarily have to be all about here's how I did it right. It can be a lot of times about here's how I did it wrong. Here's what I learned from that. And here's how I'm going to apply it again to make sure, you know, that it happens differently in the future. So I think that kind of relates back to critical um, thinking as well. Um, watching your audience for sure. Um, you know, as I'm sitting here um, doing this presentation, it's difficult because I don't have an audience to watch. So um, it's very difficult to tell without any kind of feedback if I'm um, engaging um, my participants with my content um, or not. But when you're at the conference and you're in front of people, um, it'll be uh, much easier to do that. So, you know, there are a lot of nonverbals. You can tell when people are engaged in your in your content and what you're saying, what you're doing, especially by the questions that they're asking. And, and I will say I have some very good questions that have come in so far. So it looks like maybe we're doing okay. Um, and leaving early. And just because someone leaves early, it doesn't always mean that they're not interested. They may just, you know, attend part of the session and say, oh, this really wasn't what I thought it was. I'm gonna try something else. Or they may just be trying to hit a lot of different um, sessions. Although in our general, um, delegate population. That doesn't typically happen at our conferences, I don't think, as much as it does at some other conferences. Um, so it's not real um, prevalent, um, but it does happen. But that can also be an indicator, too, of the way that you're engaging your audience. Language to avoid, of course, you know, technical jargon and, and acronyms. We all have them. We have a ton of them. Um, and it's very difficult um, to kind of describe things without it sometimes, but it's just something to put an eye to. 
you know, it's something you can, again, when you're practicing, you know, Christine mentioned practicing with your colleagues, uh, maybe ask them to see if they can scan it and pick up, you know, have you used anything that might not, you know, be familiar to, to everyone and they may, you know, may interfere with their understanding of what you're trying to tell them. Um, obviously, any language that is derogatory, um, we always uh, obviously want to avoid anything too political or um, any of those types of topics, although sometimes um, in some of the topics that we have, we, we want to do that purposely. Um, and um, obviously, analogies and euph euphemisms that are um, US centric, especially since we're not going to be in the US um, this time. So, um, and I think um, I know myself, I can always get better at at doing that. And Erica mentioned using the microphone and how it's about the audience. And um, I always use the microphone because I'm kind of a low talker, I think. Um, and so, but for those of us who aren't, you know, and aren't accustomed to using a microphone, we really want to encourage um, folks to do that. And I know that I, on the Presenter Service Center, I think it's one of the things that we ask presenters to agree to is to, you know, actively engage in using that microphone. It's very important. We wanted to bring up timing um, because some, this is actually feedback that we've gotten in the past from presenters themselves saying, um, and not only presenters, but actually attendees saying, you know, we had 50 minutes or, or we had 30 minutes and it just wasn't even close to enough time to, to talk about the content. And, and that can often be the case. And one thing we want to point out is that when you think about your outline and your content, think about the timing of it and knowing that a, there's going to be minutes at the beginning of your presentation at the end that are going to be taken up with logistical things. Probably maybe at least five, five to 10 minutes because the first couple minutes of your presentation is going to be, you know, people have 15 minutes in between ed sessions. So they're coming from one to another. Um, they get in, you have your moderator there that's helping them get settled and get their evaluation sheets. Um, and it just make it, you know, take a few extra minutes to get settled and, and get um, started. So, so you don't exactly have all of those 50 minutes. So you want to plan for some time in there that's going to be non-content presentation time. And that you're also going to have Q&A time at the end. So you definitely want to build that in because that's really important. Um, and then transition time too, um, you know, especially if you're, uh, some people are presenting back to back. So they have only a few minutes to wrap up a presentation and get to another one. We try not to do that, but it does happen. Um, one um, sort of trick, I guess, is to when you're finished with your presentation, I know a lot of times uh, attendees will be able to have questions and they'll want to walk up to the presenter and ask the questions. But one thing you want to do is kind of walk away from the podium, because that way, when you're away from the podium, the other presenters can get in and get their laptop set up and get themselves going. So you can still stay for a few minutes and engage with the participants, but just make you make sure you leave space at that podium for the other presenters to go ahead and get um, to get set up. So timing is very important. So I want to talk about copyright. I know awful, dreadful subject of copyright, um, but we do have to talk about it. Um, it's something that um, we all kind of know about. A few people, I think, really understand it and, and you know, People have degrees and, and uh, you know, spend their lives uh, studying copyright law. So we're certainly, uh, we ourselves are not copyright lawyers, but we wanted to provide some general guidelines on this somewhat mysterious subject to, I guess, the intent would be to try to stay on the right side of the law with copyright um, as best you can. And if you follow some pretty simple principles, it's actually not that hard to do. Um, I wanted to point out that in the Presenter Service Center, we did um, have a checkbox there about ensuring that all of your materials and pictures and graphics are free from copyright protections, and that you have the permission to use it, um, whatever proper uh, permissions that you needed to get for it, that you have those. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about what does that actually mean. And so I had to actually go back through my presentation and, and replace some of the images I had with royalty-free images because that's actually a really important thing to do. Even, you know, it's so easy to just go, you know, go to Google Images and, and, you know, find a picture of what you're looking for and just plop it in your presentation. Who's going to know, right? But they're getting better and better at figuring these things out. And it's, it's really something we have to think about, especially when we're on the big stage or thinking about that these you know, things are going to be published on the website and in mobile app, um, it's really better to try and find royalty-free images here. So I put this little 
um, tutorial in here. If you're not familiar with how to do that in Google Images, um, you can just follow these steps and you will find royalty-free images. Sometimes I'm, you know, they're not as good, I feel like sometimes, but I'd rather choose that than get into trouble with copyright. Um, there are also websites that are devoted to just royalty-free images. So Shutterstock, Pixabay, um, Unsplash, I use those all the time, and they're pretty good. Um, linking versus copying. So this is kind of a, a one way. So if you think about the word copy and copyright. Um, so if I, you know, people ask this question a lot, you know, well, I have a YouTube video, but it's not my video. Can I use that? Yes, you can use the YouTube video. You're linking it. And, and there's actually, um, when you embed it in a presentation, um, that even gives you a little bit more of a fail safe there too, because they're, you know, they're providing a link for you to embed it. Um, and I'm not going to get into the whole, you know, subject of public domain because that's a whole other thing. But generally, if you're, you know, and always give credit to it too. If you if you link to it um, in your in your PowerPoint and you give copy to it, generally you're going to be pretty safe. Um, you know, just don't don't take credit for it. Once you copy a thing or download it, so if you took that YouTube video and you downloaded it and copied it. The minute you copy something, that's when copyright starts to apply in a different way. So if you link to a document, it's pretty much OK. If you copy that document and then embed it in something or um, hand out that document without the copyright to it, that's when you can get into a little bit more of a problem with copyright. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, so obviously, using someone else's original thoughts, knowledge, pretty much anything without their um, consent is a copyright violation. So you must always give credit to that. Um, and I presented the caveat earlier that, you know, I'm obviously not a copyright lawyer, but, um, you know, if ever you are in doubt, just always get copyright position, uh, permission. And if you're, if you're worried about it, you know, don't use it. That's my rule of thumb. So I hope that, I hope that helped a little bit uh, to clear up a somewhat murky subject. I don't want to go on about it too long. Um, wanted to talk a bit about, oh, Christine's going to talk about moderators. All right, so just wanted to talk a little bit about moderators. First of all, if you're interested in moderating, um, we can always use more moderators. So feel free to email me. My email address was on the first uh, slide and I'll make sure to get you set. Um, we, uh, so what do the moderators do? Things have changed a little bit for this upcoming conference. So really they assist the presenters with timing and making sure that the session starts and ends on time. They will have a um, piece of paper to hold up when there are five minutes left in the presentation um, so that you know that. If you want more time than that, all you have to do is ask. Um, I know often I'll kind of hold up two hands for 10 minutes um, and sometimes that can be helpful or kind of, you know, do something to let them know. Um, this year, moderators will not be introducing presenters. And the reason why we've moved to that is that most of the presenters don't want an introduction. Um, and presenters can make that introduction often quicker than the moderators can. And so it takes up less of your presentation time for them to be able to actually um, share their um, background and what they want to share in there. Um, they will help solicit feedback on the session through the evaluation. Um, realize that at the end of your session, you should actually get part of your evaluation at that point. So if you don't, all you need to do is ask the moderator. Um, they just have to tear them apart and you get the, um, I guess, uh, um, evaluative feedback there. Um, the number feedback, so kind of the, this session met my expectations, rated on one to five, those things we send off to get processed and you receive that in the presenter service center after the conference so that you can access that information too. But that written feedback, you actually get right after your presentation. And so um, they collect that information and get that ready for you. And then they're also there to ass assist with any technology or room issues so that you don't need to worry about that as the presenter. That is the goal. Um, our This year, where the conference is and how um, the convention center is laid out is actually really helpful. It's kind of, the sessions are kind of in an L. And so the program office is right in the center of that pretty much. And so 
we will be easily accessible throughout the conference from the moderators to be able to come quickly back to us um, or reach us in another way. We're kind of working on some things like that too. But they are there to take care of that so that you can be stress-free as you're entering your presentation. Um, and so that's kind of the role of the moderator. As I said, this is um, where our office is. So we're in room 710. Uh, this is the convention center. Uh, as you can see, it's right in the heart of Toronto. It's a really um, great convention center that has had some recent updates on the inside, which is really nice. Um, and I think you'll find the presentation rooms nice as well. Um, so I hope that you will come and share with us your experience of presenting after you get done with your presentation. If we can be of any help at all, you can find us in room 710 during the conference. Or again, you have my contact information on that first page as well as Lori. Excellent. Thanks, Christine. I'm just going to go ahead and just go into a couple questions, if that's all right. And we can just kind of, um, the three of us can kind of jump in and answer these. Can I add one note really quickly? Yeah, go ahead. Um, one of the things that you may want to check on as a presenter um, is if you are bringing an electronic device such as a laptop that is owned by your university or your college, you may want to check with your technology department to find out if you need to do anything to take it if you are a if you are taking it across <laughs> um, into another country. So if you are a US person and you are traveling to Canada, um, I know, where I work, I needed to provide some information and need to have a form with me in order to go through customs with that laptop. So I just wanted to put that out there um, since most of you likely will be bringing some sort of technology to be able to use during your presentation. And feel free to share that with colleagues as well. That's a good point, Christine. I'd forgotten about that. All right, I've got a couple questions, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, run through those. So again, if you think of any other questions um, while we're um, talking about these, feel free to go ahead and type them in. And you can always, obviously, um, you know, I'm going to switch back to the slide at the beginning that has our emails on it, if that's all right, because then we can, um, folks can email us if they think of things. Oh boy, it's going to make me walk through all of, see, this is why you don't do fancy graphics. <laughs> there we go. All right. So uh, that way you can, um, if you think of something later, you can email us. Okay. So um, one question was, should we bring our own clicker to advance the slides? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, once in a while we do have an extra laying around. Sometimes someone leaves one and, and so we have it at one in the program office, but I definitely wouldn't count on that. So if you are going to want to use a clicker to advance your slides, by all means, definitely bring one. Um, I had a couple questions about using Prezi. And I feel like, Erica, I feel like I, in that document that you referenced earlier, it says something about using Prezi Right. So Prezi is really not um, all that accessible. Uh, it does not uh, work well with screen readers that people may be using. So um, the visual movement uh, can also be really difficult. So um, I know that it might mean a pretty significant sort of presentation style adjustment. Uh, and I would just uh, encourage you to think, do you, do you want to engage uh, everyone or do you want to engage the majority? And if you want to try and engage everyone, I might really recommend um, using PowerPoint as opposed to Prezi in terms of universal design. All right. Very good, Erica. Thank you. Um, I had a question about if my presenter information is um, incorrect on the website, is there a way to change it? Yes. Um, please email me and I will take care of changing that in the database. If you have some updates to your program as well, um, please send those to me or presenter changes or, um, you know, so suddenly, you know, one presenter is coming and not coming and this person is coming. I can take care of all of that. So please use my email that's listed here, elsabata at akuhawaii.org. Email me directly and I'd be happy to um, take care of that for you. 
Um, so actually, those were all the questions that I have. So um, hopefully maybe that means we did a pretty good job of covering the content. And again, I'm sure folks will email me if they have um, additional questions. Um, I know that we did send out an email um, earlier this week, I think, presenters, a few presenter reminders um, about, you know, presentations are due to be uploaded June 7th. And if you haven't registered, please do so, those sorts of things, and check in the Presenter Service Center. So um, hopefully all of you saw that. Um, and we'll be sending out a couple more of those types of emails, um, too, obviously, before we get to Toronto. So, um, so be sure to watch for those. Um, so uh, unless we had, uh, Christine or Erica, did you have any closing thoughts before we wrap up? Not for me. I just want to thank everyone for all of the work that you've already put into your presentation and um, wish you luck in completing that presentation. Thank you so much. We wouldn't be able to do this conference without you. Yes, that's certainly true. And thank you, Christine and Erica, for joining us today. I didn't get one other quick question. That's a good question. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, answer it real quick as a copy of the presentation. So um, what we're going to do in the Presenter Service Center is we're going to put a link to the YouTube video and then a copy of a, a link to the PowerPoint slides as well so that you could either watch the YouTube presentation or just download the slides if you wanted to read through those as well. So we'll be putting that up in the Presenter Service Center. Um, so yes, is the answer to that question. So, okay, I know we're coming up on on, uh, on the hour here, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Again, um, everyone, thank you so much, and I really look forward to seeing everyone in Toronto. Come see us in room 710. We'll see you there. Bye, everyone.